Welcome to After Dark Online. Thanks for joining us as we continue to explore the world through science, art, and conversation. My name is Sam, and I'm a program developer as part of the team that produces After Dark. And though this program is virtual, the Exploratorium is located on Pier 15 in San Francisco, on unceded territory of the Ramatouche Ohlone. We recognize that we are guests on this land, and we honor the conservation and stewardship the Ohlone have offered the ecology we currently inhabit. In tonight's program, we'll be exploring the intersection of art and science, each as separate practices that share common methods and potentials for discovery and wonder. Now, arts has been integral to the Exploratorium since its opening in 1969, when it hosted an exhibition called Cybernetic Serendipity. Curated by Jaisea Reichhardt, it was a showcase of the aesthetic and creative potential of robots and computers, designed both by scientists and artists. We continue to blend these two disciplines on the temporary and permanent exhibitions at the Exploratorium to this day, offering visitors to make their own connections between these two. What's following tonight is conversations with three separate artists who each blend science into their creative practice. You'll meet Lucia Monge, a Peruvian artist who has sent potatoes into space, Olivia Ting, whose hearing aids have inspired her to recast the body as an instrument, and Leah Holleran, who creates large-scale astronomical prints of nebula and galaxies. We hope you enjoy these conversations and encourage you to check out the show notes for tonight's broadcast to learn more about these artists and their incredible work. Hi, Lucia. Thanks so much for joining us tonight for this conversation. Hi, Sam. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. So I'm really interested in your artistic process and some of your background. Can you start by introducing your practice and yourself? Yes. So my name is Lucia Monge and I'm a Peruvian artist. Um, I've always been interested in the way people relate to the natural world, to other living beings. And I personally have a preference for plants. I'm fascinated about um, plants and, and trees and learning about them. And I've, a lot of my practice have, has focused especially on the role that movement plays in our relationship to plants. How, because we don't always see plants move, it helps us um, or it can lead for us to treat them differently than we treat animals. Mm. And can you talk a little bit about your background as an artist or as an inquisitive person and maybe how science fits into that? Yes, um, I, I've always been interested in nature, right? And observing nature and learning more about nature. And, and science has been a, a method or a tool for me to learn more. So I have some tools from the art world, but I also love how science has other tools that are sometimes very different and combining them both allows me to better understand um, you know, other living beings around me. And I think it all started with my grandfather. Um, we, his nickname was Choclo, which means corn. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can see him in the screen now. Um, we grew up very close and he and I would spend, and my brother and I would spend long time in the garden looking at the birds that were around. He would lend us his binoculars, he would bring, bird books. Um, sometimes uh, he would bring some animals back from the lab when the experiments were done. So I grew up having very um, much stranger pets than my peers at school. But that time with him in the garden was very important for 
uh, my understanding of the world around me and for my pleasure in observing and spending long time observing. And I think that observation is the, um, is the seed for both arts and sciences. Um, after that, I, um, I used to teach also science K through six in Peru while I had my artist practice. And at that point, um, not only the observation that the science has, but also the um, asking the questions of how everything works around me, things that as an adult, I was supposed to already know, but re-asking those questions again was very important for me and my art practice. And since then, I've been um, trying to find myself in situations where I can be having conversations with scientists and combining some tools and methods from science with those from the arts. Can you talk a bit more about how you start with the question and then where you look for aid in helping with that question and who you collaborate with on your projects? Yes, questions are um, a big part of my work. As an artist, sometimes um, I see an image of something that I want to do, like it's a visual representation of an idea. But a lot of times, my favorite times, there's a question where I'm thinking, how would that work? Or is that even possible? And then that starts a series of experiments that are usually designed, you know, from a perspective of an artist. Um, I'm interested in, in using the language of science poetically, mm -hmm. right? So adding some of the artistic perspective and the things that artists can do, because art can ask very different questions than scientists can, right? Um, but we, I think we have similar processes in working those questions out by having these experiments, by observing what's happening, uh, recording the results, and recording those observations, and then, um, having more questions, right? The beautiful thing for me is that at the end of this quest for an answer, what I have is more questions so that then I keep, can keep going for more experimentation. And the same way that I'm looking to science to have more tools and more ways of, of learning um, about plants or mushrooms or ducks or other living beings, um, I'm looking at others and I think uh, collaboration is key because I, I can see things that I couldn't see on my own and I can mm -hmm. do things that I couldn't do on my own. So collaboration is key for me and sometimes I collaborate with scientists and, and I, I think that's a, a beautiful combination, arts and science, um, in the way that we think, both as creative disciplines, I think. Um, but then I can also collaborate with people from other disciplines. And I'm interested also in collaborating with people who are not necessarily defined by a discipline, but we all have a way of seeing the world different. So I think collaboration is rich in that way too. And then ultimately I'm also interested in collaborating with other living beings. Mm. I understand the experiments that I do as opportunities to not just study, have objects of study, right that distance that sometimes science has to have or that usually science has to be able to be um, objective they have to objectify the the study um, i'm interested in, in in the beings that i'm working with and, and that participate in my experiments as subjects so how i don't need to separate myself how they i can recognize them as beings and then bring myself as another being into a situation where we have to um do something together. So I see a lot of these plants and, and other living beings that I'm working with as collaborators as well. So that's a wonderful way to put, you're not only creating dialogue with other artists and scientists, but also with the materials and beings themselves um, as a continuing dialogue. And you've brought some images of some of the ways you've interweaved scientific thinking into your um, practice. Can you share some of those? Yes, of course. Um, so I'm sharing now an image of a project called Mi Niño, Your Dry Spell, Their Waterfall. And the project started by looking at plants, desert plants in the Namaqualand Desert in South Africa and asking the question, how do plants conserve 
water? How do they capture water? How do they, what are the strategies when there is little water, like in a desert? And how we can, um, those in, how can those strategies inspire the ways that we um, think of objects that humans have to, to deal with water, the same kind of um, activities, right? To capture and conserve. So in this case, the, the science um, contribution is very much as inspiration. So I'm using microscopes and I'm learning about botany to learn about these plants um, and look at these plants in a new way and then use those forms, those adaptations in the plants to um, adapt human tools like a, this is a fog catching cup. So um, that is designed or, or sculpted in, in incorporating a lot of these strategies that I found in the plants. Mm -hmm. So in this case, science is, a, is an inspiration in a way um, for me. In other, other times, I'm using uh, tools and methods, almost like protocols from the science world. Um, I've been working with um, mushrooms. I'm very interested in fungi. And I started being interested in them because they have these connections with plants underground. And I've been wanting to talk to plants for a long time. So when I, I found out about these mycorrhizal networks and how mushrooms were doing it, I thought that's, um, that's worthwhile um, exploring and learning more. So a lot of the times I have to, when I'm cloning a mushroom or a growing mushrooms, the, the, um, the situation has to be very clean. There has to be sterilization. There has to be um, certain uh, protocols that are um, yeah, specific to the science world. So here I'm showing a petri dish where um, with a, um, the central part has a piece of a mushroom. And then all of these white threads around are the mycelium that are growing um, around it, feeding, eating from the, um, the substrate, the agar and the nutrients that were put there. But then all these growing of these mushrooms um, and cloning them can then be applied to different applications that maybe a scientist would do. And, and I'm showing here a picture of a megaphone that I made um, using um, the growth of the mushroom. So this object was constructed by mycelium, but those same threads that we saw in the last image. And I think of it as a megaphone for a tree, thinking mm. of these um, mycorrhizal networks. And this sculpture came out of the same process of growing those mushroom in the petri dish and you did it enough to build out this object. Yes, so um, the mushroom grows first in the petri dish and then it goes to a mold where there is sterilized um, agricultural waste. Um, in this case, it was wood chips, but I've also used um, the skin and the center of a corn. So you can use different kinds of agricultural waste that is then sterilized. And then the mushroom goes in and starts growing around all of this material and it binds it together as, until it becomes a solid. So then wow. I can take the mold out and I have this um, object sculpture. Um, so then I'm also interested not only in the inspiration from taking inspiration from science and using tools and methods from science, but also questioning um, some of the, that process. And for me, that questioning, one way to question is to embody it, embody those, the process of science. And, and I'm showing here a picture uh, of our project called Reperforming Darwin, where I'm studying how Darwin studied climbing plants. And then I'm reperforming the experiments as I think he describes them. But also uh, the idea of the re-performance is I am not an Englishman from, you know, <laughs> from back then. I'm a Latina woman living in the US with a whole different cultural background and hence cultural bias too, which I think is important to recognize, mm. right? So as I do these experiments, what are the situations that arise? What are the... Um, what is the worldview that I bring in? What's the identity? And also what does it feel in the body to um, the experiments that he did included observing, making notes every hour, every half hour of 
some part of the plant. In this case, here is a drawing of the tendrils. Mm. And you can see each color line is, is the, the position of the tendril at a different time. So there's all this movement that is happening, but it's so minute that it's very easy for not to, not to see. But what does it mean to go every hour, every half hour, to place your body in front of the plant again and try to trace it? No? Um, so the pictures that, that I showed before are the, the tools that I made for my experiments that I think are probably different than what Darwin used, but they're my version now. And then um, this is a result of one of these observations. Um, Part of what I love about this process is this deep looking and this slowing down to pay attention to plants in this case and notice the min minute movements. For a lot of us, we only may walk by a plant or a tree once or twice a day, and we wouldn't be able to really tell what kind of life or movement it has. But here you're zooming in on, on the process, and it reminds me that life is ongoing and um, on a spectrum, that it's, it's slow, but it's always in motion. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's, that's a big interest for me. In, in plants, how how the scale and the speed of their movement is so different than ours that it's it's a lot of times it is just um, unseen, but it's so wonderful. It's like suddenly you didn't know, but next to you there was all this movement and life around it. That, so those little windows um, for me to when those things become apparent um, are magical. And this leads me to a current project that you're working on in collaboration where you really aren't able to see what's going on with some small plant movement. Can you talk about Unearthing Futures? Yes, of course. Um, Unearthing Futures is a project that I'm working in collaboration with Xin Liu, who's a friend who's an artist and also an engineer, has a background in engineer, engineering. And um, so Unearthing Futures is a project where we start thinking about space travel and who gets to go to space and what are they doing when they're going to space and, and thinking about how a lot of times the, the, the dialogue or the language around traveling to space is similar to the language of um, colonial adventures, well, colonial explorations more than adventures, explorations um, many years ago. So we were interested in creating a project where we can think of space exploration in non-colonial terms. And to do that, we thought we would work with potatoes, with Peruvian potatoes. And we're calling on Peruvian potatoes as a very diverse species. Um, it, it, there's around 4,500 varieties of potatoes in Peru. So it's the whole species is, is based on diversity. They come in all kinds of colors and shapes. So we thought they would be great messengers for, for this idea of, of how do we travel to space and in a different way? Um, and how do we include different versions of what the future looks like? Not just a single one, the, a single narrative, right? Um, so for this project, we, we work with some scientists. There's a, a International Potato Center that has headquarters in Peru and, and other uh, locales around the world. And they helped us select some seeds. These are the, uh, what are called true potato seeds. Um, usually when you plant a potato on the ground for as a crop, you will use uh, a potato itself. But potatoes also have these seeds. That's why they call them the true potato seeds because uh, the potatoes are used as seeds so often mm. that these have to be the true ones. Um, but these are growing inside um, berries in, uh, after the flower, the plant flowers. We, sit, we had to work with seeds this size because this is a, a picture of a potato berry. It's dehydrated. So when it's not dehydrated, it looks a little bit like a cherry tomato. Um, but inside, this is a container for all those true potato seeds. And we had to work with true potato seeds because a fir the first part of our project involved sending some of these potato seeds actually to space. So we had 125 Peruvian potato seeds that traveled 
um, in a payload to the International Space Station and stayed there for a month. That container where the potato seeds were, um, this is the picture showing that container, is very small. It's um, 1.5 centimeters in diameter, which is small. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the inches for that, but it's more, I was talking to about this with a group of students, high school uh, school students, and I equated it to a Cheerio. So it's more or less the size of a Cheerio. So, and, and the potato seeds are more or less the size of quinoa grains. So oh. they're very small. And that's the space that we had to, in the payload. This is a picture of the payload that has, um, different containers in them. This, we were able to send these potatoes to space as part of a, a open call by MIT that selected nine different projects, art projects, to be included in this payload and then be sent to the International Space Station. So our project was one of those nine projects. Um, and then here is uh, the launch, the <laughs> this is the, um, you'll see the potatoes going to space, which was a very exciting um, day, of course. And again, there is an, an interest here in, to me, in making this project on two, on one hand, it's, it's a continuation of my older or more common frequent questions around plants and movement. Now, this time we're moving to space. Mm -hmm. um, it's also part of my concerns around uh, conservation. So as there are more and more um, crises, ecological crises on Earth, what does it mean to go elsewhere? And if we're going to go elsewhere with the same logics of exploitation of land, then we kind of didn't learn anything, right? Like, we're just going to repeat the same thing. So one of my interests in working in this project is that, right, there is an ecological concern um, around it and a diversity concern around it. But then on the other hand, it's also an opportunity for me to learn about space. I didn't know all those things that I know now and that I keep learning. Um, now I'm, I'm working on, on um, Space Potato Academy with a group of students here in, in Portland at a school, doctor's a Martin Luther King Jr. School, um, where we are uh, preparing some potatoes to go on a speculative journey to a, pl a dwarf planet called Haumea. Mm. So I, I keep learning about the potatoes. Um, anyway, the potatoes came back from space and we designed a, an experiment. Um, half of our potatoes went to space and half stayed on Earth. And we grew them alongside to see if we would notice any differences. Um, this is a petri dish. The seeds on the right are marked with a yellow sticker. All the yellow stickers were earthbound seeds. And then the ones on the left marked with pink are um, the potatoes that went to space. So then we started growing them. Um, first they grew on petri dishes. Then they went to small uh, peat pellets. And then they went to pots, individual pots um, outside. Um, this is my garden and half of the potatoes I grew in Portland, Oregon, where I'm based now, and half of the potatoes were grown in New York with Shin. Um, and then we harvested these potatoes and the, um, the beautiful thing, one of the most beautiful things for me about this project is harvesting these potatoes and then, I don't know if you would agree, but they look like planets and galaxies to me now. I'm like obsessed with these seeds and staring into these seeds and like seeing just um, so much space to grow, right? And these seeds are um, clones. They have the same genetic information as the potatoes that went to space. So next summer we will grow these potatoes again and we will have a second generation of space potatoes. So this project involves many um, different elements and, and it's an ongoing project. So yeah, I, we will keep working on it and hopefully share more in the future. 
I really appreciate how these projects are ongoing and avail availing us of discovery at every step along the way, whether it's drawing those visual connections of potatoes and galaxies, or again, pausing to watch how these plants may grow and that it's continuous and open-ended, much like these scientific generation of question after question. It's really a wonderful project. Um, in wrapping up, I'm wondering if you could say what you hope people take away from your artwork and art practice. Um, that's a good question. I, I hope we can inspire some of the love for plants that I have. I hope, um, I don't know, maybe next time you see a potato, you can wonder if your potato went to space or maybe next time you are, um, you have a plant, you don't, you maybe are inspired to speak to them in terms of, um, you know, as a person or a being instead of an object or you pay attention to them moving. So I, there is no value that I'm trying to be like, you have to be this way. But I'm hoping that my curiosity sparks curiosity in others. Well, thank you, Lucia, so much for your time, sharing your process work and those interconnections between art and science. Thank you, Sam. Hi, Olivia. Thanks so much for joining us for this conversation at After Dark Online. Hi, Sam. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad to be here. Yeah, and I'm really interested in some of your artist practice and how you weave science into some of what you explore. But first, can we start out by introducing your practice and your background? Sure. Um, I am predominantly a visual artist. I would describe that I work with um, photography and videos, which I shoot myself. But I take that another step and I compile them into an, an audiovisual experience. And generally, they are intended as an on-site uh, projection. So um, it's more of creating an immersive experience that um, hopefully take you into an internal space. So, um, but because of COVID limitations, um, this time my project ends up being uh, presented on, on a web format. Mm -hmm. And you have some background in science, is that right? Yes. Uh, a long history with science, although I never went into it as a career. Um, as most Asian Americans go, um, we are strongly encouraged to choose science or uh, law or accounting. And um, I actually did quite well in science. My mom was a nurse. Um, and uh, so um, I took a lot of uh, biology classes. Uh, all through high school and through um, college, uh, pre-med classes. And um, somewhere along and after I prepared for the MCAT, I realized, oh, hmm, I don't think this is the right path for me. So I sort of saved into graphic design, but um, interestingly, I think the process of thinking is still quite similar because um, with graphic design, you are uh, doing a lot of um, information flow and analysis, which kind of brings me back to thinking of things like exercises that we did, like the scientific theory or scientific method. So, um, and as I move along further in my practice, I find that I circle back to um, observing nature for inspiration. And I think science is a way how we understand nature. Part of this observation, uh, especially of the environment around me, um, I'm slowly starting to realize it has to do with the, how, the way how I, how I hear. Um, because I was born with a hearing, hearing loss of uh, about 20% residual hearing in both ears. So I um, actually don't have much memory of that. But up to six years old, then I had testing and then realized, oh, well, you need some help there. So, um, but even so, I mean, hearing aids are never a kind of a, a perfect, um, they don't, they don't just miraculously aid, uh, bring back natural hearing. So um, I think a lot of it has to do with um, only when, when I hear, I hear, I don't have a stereo perception. So if I hear a sound, they tend to be an isolated thing or a piece of data and I would have to find out where it's coming from. 
And in that way, it becomes this sort of fragment piece of um, stimuli in my environment. So I would always have to kind of look around and piece them back together. So um, I think fast forward to about, I had hearing in both ears until about the age of in my mid twenties. And sometimes it's, it's very common for nerve deafness to just kind of shut down. Mm -hmm. And there was no apparent physical reason I didn't get ill or, so then it was just one-sided. <laughs> so in that time, um, that's about 15 years of time when this ear has stopped hearing. So that is um, a place into um, reconnecting with learning how to hear because you think about a muscle that's been unused for 15 years, then your body has to relearn how to use that, those muscles again. So um, I actually got the implant for the, co the cochlear implant um, two years ago. Hmm. And um, the activation happens fairly soon after, but the sound is incredibly strange because um, although I was hearing all these pictures, but the brain just didn't know how to put all this stuff together. So that was something I had to learn. Um, and uh, it was very interesting to observe your own body, trying to relearn how to use that part too. And which brings me back to one of the um, the process of being um, approved for the implant is that we had to read a book about um, by someone who has had an implant. And so I read a book um, called Rebuilt. It's by Michael Koost. And um, this man had an implant in 2001. So the technology was slightly different then, but he was a computer programmer and he also compared himself to a cyborg, mm. which I thought, was a really interesting concept right there because then this kind of breaks down this relationship that we have with technology as well. Um, especially that we have now, most of us have, have uh, cell phones and computers. Um, right now we're talking to each other on Zoom and it really blows the boundaries of our, our physical bodies. And so initially, I was really fascinated by all my trip to the, to the audiologist because um, she would test me, have these sounds, and then she'd write these numbers. I would explain to her, I'm hearing a voice like this. I don't hear um, the low sound, I just hear the top, and she's okay. So it's, it's a very roundabout way of describing sound, but somehow, you know, she gets it and she makes these adjustments. I was like, what do these numbers mean? So she write on all the just uh, weird numbers. And then I was like, that's me, that's my hearing. <laughs> and then she could also tell me, but she plugged in my hearing aid, I'm um, in my implant side. She could say, oh, did you do your um, practice today? Was, yes, I did. I said, okay, I see you have about 20% of noise, 20% of, of music and 60% of human hearing. And I thought, oh my God, I couldn't even lie about it. But that was how fascinating it was. So, so some of the human experience becomes data and just bits of information that can be taken apart and put back together. Absolutely. absolutely. Um, and, and that was just fascinating to me. I was trying to think of um, creating this analogy of the range of frequency of sound to colors that we can see. Mm. So the left ear, which is my um, older ear, I mean, older in the sense that it has been sharing for a much longer time. So I had a much broader range of, of sounds. Um, and then the right side, which is so new. So um, there's so little detail there. And there's a lot of, uh, I guess what you would call static, because, mm -hmm. you know, basically the nerve is just pulsating. Um, and, and then, and interestingly, over time, and I, and I was interested to see how this, this would change over time. This is something that's probably about a few months. Um, this is probably something that's about a year. Mm. Um, I was starting to hear, and then interestingly, this is for a piano because I, I would start to hear tones, but I was still not understanding speech mm -hmm. because um, speech is, there's such an emphasis on different ranges, certain percentages of frequencies of sound. 
So music always has felt more safe to me or more comfortable because it's a different way of understanding sounds. And so musicality, you say, we talk about it being easier to translate with how you perceive the world and you have a background as a pianist as well. Can you talk a little bit about your current project and connecting this experience of hearing and music and the architecture of a uh, piano? Um, yeah, so uh, definitely music or something uh, that I, I go very close to me because going back, <laughs> going back to being um, Asian American families, uh, you start preparing for college applications when you were six because you took all the extracurricular activities that would be good to create yourself as a well-rounded individual. So um, I ended up with piano. Um, but I think perhaps what it is about the piano is the physicality of the, this huge instrument. You push something and you get a sound. And, and again, um, I think that the fact that the tonality of music and the fact that you are somehow controlling the output of the sound um, makes it less confusing for me if, if I'm trying to understand some, what, something that people are saying to me. There's just so many factors that people are talking about. I can't see their mouth, uh, they're behind me, they're too far. So, um, and then eventually I enrolled in the conservatory of music. They had a preparatory department um, and you go down the hallway and it's not people talking, but it's all these instruments mm. like trying to outshout each other, but I can tell what instrument they were. And um, so somehow that felt like a, I could, I could understand that world. And so um, I continued studying piano uh, fairly seriously until um, 20, and I finished uh, uh, high school, applied to college. And then uh, I continued practicing until I lost a human in the right year. But getting the, um, the implant, as a catalyst to reconnecting it with the understanding, however, that I may never achieve this memory of the sound that I think is there. Um, but um, I think the it's the process of letting 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 myself know that I, I may not actually hear that but allowing the imagination mm. and, um, but so much, I think so much of playing the piano is not just the sound, but it's also this, this physical relationship that you have with the instrument because of uh, the technique that you impart on it. And I think this kind of comes back to, and so I re, uh, rekindled a, a committed practice, uh, which was, a big thing because I thought I could just, oh, I've had 20 years of study, I could just pick it up. No, I lost a lot of stamina, a lot of um, body memory. And so sitting opposite the piano, I, I see it as a mirror because it's like, I think, oh my God, this piano has 12,000 moving parts inside of it. And a human likewise um, has, 200 something bone, 86 organs. And so this is kind of a parallel. And we have a symbiotic relationship without, um, without each other. We're both silent entities, but mm -hmm. somehow this uh, symbiotic relationship, we create sound, organized sound, music, emotions. So I think that what really started my um, research in between the similarity between these two bodies. So um, I started with graphs, trying to understand a little bit more about the interior of a piano. As I said, it's 12,000 moving parts. Um, and this illustration shows that just the key alone, that's 30 moving parts where you press the key and the hammer, da 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 da, -da the hammer hits it and you get a tone. You think it's so simple. But it's amazing. And, and I thought, I look at other charts and I thought it was really amazing how um, graphic 
uh, graphic illustration of the process of hearing from the sound to the middle ear, inner ear, middle ear. It's just, it's, there's a certain kind of visual similarity there. Before I had embarked on this, I, when I first started uh, practicing the piano again, I think I had just looked at the piano from the, on the outside. Um, so I had I done a VR a study of what it's like to be interacting with the piano from a first person perspective. But then after doing these, uh, this research, then I thought, well, to take it another step further, uh, what happens if you can take a camera inside the piano? It's like permeating this, the skin of the self, permeating yourself and permeating the piano. And I, I think what I found in it, it's a certain change in the scale because uh, we look at the piano, it's this big black box. Everything is very complex. You have no idea what's going on inside there. Um, but once you put a camera in there, so I was basically rummaging the inside of the piano with the camera. And I used a, a wide lens camera because uh, it really gave it an architectural sense. Um, and in that sense, the interior of piano become, becomes a body, you know. Mm. It is, it's a body where sound is made. So it's a sound factory, it, but it's just opposite of you as a sound maker and you, you interact with the sound factory. Um, for example, some of these images I felt like I could almost feel a wave of sound washing over me. Mm. Or, um, or sometimes I was playing with uh, light how light would affect the uh, the form of the interior of the piano. Because these things are not moving. You, know, you, you can't be shooting and playing at the same time. So I was playing with the light. But then even the light would inform these shapes of this piano. And you know, it's kind of like synesthesia, where you think of sound as, as light as well. And so um, that was a visual element. But pianos are not silent. Uh, human is not silence. But this huge instrument, traditionally, the keyboard, only the keyboard is meant for sound producing. Mm -hmm. But why not look into the possibilities of all these other elements like the strings, the wood, the pedal. Uh, so um, in other words, thinking about it as a body like yourself. So um, I think these two came together um, having this sound as a, a script, if you will, for the, the progression of this visual that I have created in this, this spreadsheet. And um, it just went from there. And so you not only captured the piano through these beautiful cathedral-like interiors through the photographs, but you also made a video out of it as well. Can you talk about what the experience you hope for people to have as they view the video component to Beethoven's box? Yes, um, I think I think making video used to have intimidated me a lot in the idea of a film where you have to have a narrative, um, a narrative flow. But I think I love this be an audiovisual experience. Um, it's also but taking in all these levels of uh, commentary, uh, visual commentary, so to speak, of these juxtapositions of, of this, this form, the piano form and the human form. And, um, and I think I wanted more the feeling of the visceral feeling of the, uh, the process of hearing, the process of making sound and how these, these kind of flow and your bodies and other bodies will start to blow. Well, thank you so much for your time, Olivia, and sharing some of your process and your insight. And we'll encourage everyone in the show notes to go visit the project website, um, which you can find a link on our After Dark Online listing. Thank you so much.
Hi, Leah. Thanks so much for joining the conversation tonight. Hi, Sam. Thanks. For I love me. I love your background. Can you tell us where you're calling in from? This is not a Zoom background. This is my actual physical studio in Los Angeles. Give you a little pan around of some uh, fun different projects going on behind me. Um, it, it, you're uh, visiting an old drapery warehouse turned artist studios. Well, thanks so much for inviting us um, into your space, as it were. Um, you have a lot of amazing work up there, and I'm excited to have this conversation with you about some of your practice and some of the ways that you think about science, incorporating science or scientific thinking into what you do. And your work is pretty multidisciplinary. You do printmaking, photography, video. Um, but can you start the conversation by telling us a little bit about your background and history? Well, absolutely. And uh, quite on brand, my, uh, my origins start at the Exploratorium. Um, when I was uh, 15 years old, I requested that my parents have my 15th birthday party at the Exploratorium. And we had uh, tickets to the Tactile Dome. And before we went to the Tactile Dome, we stopped to uh, get a cow-eyed dissection demonstration. And um, I was so engaged with it that by the end, the, um, the explainer said, hey, kid, you should apply <laughs> to work at the Exploratorium. So I put my application in, and a couple months later, my very first job was uh, at the Exploratorium doing cow eye dissections, laser demonstrations, walking around, asking the public if they wanted to learn about magnets. And this really is the way that I think of my studio practice. I started off um, as an explainer and then uh, was uh, transitioned to working in the machine shop. So it was very much about laying the foundation for curiosity that then also had this other element that was a confidence in building and problem solving and figuring things out. And um, I uh, went on to go to uh, college at UCLA and graduate school at Yale, but I really think of the, my studio practice much more in alignment with the way that the Exploratorium taught me how to think about problem solving and creativity. And did your interest in science change after this job at the Exploratorium? You know, it just, um, I would say it just enhanced it. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, my father is a scientist, so science was something that was never intimidated, intimidating to me. And I was always, um, you know, encouraged to follow my own curiosity. When I um, grew up in the Bay Area, my father was also a big influence on um, on me in that he is a major surfer. We grew up in, I grew up in Pacifica, and um, I think I had my first skateboard ramp in my backyard by the time I was six years old. And um, on the right, this is my big claim to fame. I was in, in, in Thrasher Magazine in 1992 at Embarcadero. Um, but both my origins at the Exploratorium and actually my origins of being a surfer and a skateboarder end up coming up in my artwork in very, very surprising ways later on. Um, when, when I was young, I think I kind of always felt like I was going to end up in the art world in some way. Um, but I definitely didn't have an inkling that I was going to be an artist that made work about science or skateboarding for that matter. Um, it was later when I went to graduate school uh, for my MFA in painting at Yale that um, I actually started integrating ideas um, and concepts of science into my work and um, that, it, you know, my work started looking like science. Yeah, and it definitely gives that feeling. And this image I'm looking at here, my immediate reaction is thinking of about wormholes, um, just mm -hmm. seeing that connection from both sides of these tunnels. Can you tell me what kind of research you put behind there? Did you lead with your imagination or did you lead with um, research first? You know, that's a great, um, that's, such a, that's such a great question because at this point I was actually using art to understand some of the science that I was reading. Mm -hmm. I, half of my coursework at Yale, I was taking in the astronomy department and some of the things I was reading about Einstein's theory of relativity and black holes and wormholes, was so mind-boggling that, mind that some of these early works, and this is a painting that's 16 feet across and five feet tall, was actually just making sense of some of the things that I was reading. 
And Yale has this fantastic um, program where there's a grant given to a grad student uh, between their first and second year of, um, of their school. And I was luckily, lucky enough to get it. And I uh, wrote a proposal to go to the Atacama Desert, the driest place on earth, to the largest telescopes on earth, to basically tag team with um, different physicists who were looking for black holes. So I think I was using science at that time to sort of drive my art practice and then using art to understand conceptually some of the concepts that I was being introduced to. Um, and it was, it was at that time that I felt uh, that there was an urgency to represent in some way, to create a dialogue between the experience I was having uh, at these observatories or in conversation with these different scientists um, of what I was seeing. And, um, you know, I think that some of my favorite and most um, <laughs> profound pieces of artwork don't really actually look too fantastic. And like this example of this piece on the right, it's a it's a uh, photo that many of you would recognize, right? It's a star trail. And the idea is you take a camera, you set it up outside, you open the camera lens, you come back in a couple hours. And what I've done here is I've messed it up because I it has a light leak and I haven't taken out the battery. But this to me is one of my favorite photos because it's like it shows the moment that I'm learning. It shows like the moment that I'm stumbling to figure something out. And um, I always think of these pieces as like proof that you yourself could prove that the earth is turning, right? Like there's no star trails. The earth is turning in space. The camera's left open and, and this is the is a recording of time. And um, I, I, lo I love that. That to me ties also back to the Exploratorium, right? Like science is experimental and it's as accessible to you and, and it can become part of your experience of the world around you. And that learning is partially about making these mistakes, but you wouldn't even call them mistakes, but just all their opportunities for wonder and discovery, where in this case, when the light leaks in the instrument, you have this beautiful aura glow that leaks in and, and adds to some of the beauty of the photograph. Right. And uh, speaking of mistakes, actually, one of the, one of my most lucky mistakes, or um, I would say happy accident, is that the film that I was using to make these long star trails, 800, 1600, if anyone remembers film, physical film, um, it only comes in rolls of 36. So if you're taking a picture, you're leaving your camera open for two, four, six hours. I mean, 36, 36 exposures, it could take you, you know, a month or half a month of taking photographs to even know what you're looking at. And so um, what I would do is I would, you know, take maybe 10 astro photographs of the night sky, and then I'd wanna get my film developed and see where I was at. And so I would make these little tiny doodles and it was as simple as writing my name. You'll see, you know, on the right, sort of a reference to that larger painting I showed you and literally just these tiny little kind of dumb, um, dumb little drawings that I would just pin up on my wall in my studio. And years later, um, when I was thinking of how I could integrate my origins of as a skateboarder, I was I came back actually to astrophysics and to how I was representing the time passing in the night sky. So um, this is a kind of a setup where you'll see that there's um, I work with two different photographers. There's a um, there's a medium format camera. The, the camera is set up and I have a light that's on my left wrist that I attach and I try not to draw with. It's just I turn it on and then I go. Um, and essentially it's me skateboarding in the darkness. And what you see is the camera lens left open, very similar to a long exposure shot of the night sky. And I'm gonna give you a little quick little video of how these are made and then I'll explain a little more. Ready. Ready. 
So what you're seeing there is a kind of behind the scenes. That was a, a series I did in Vienna. My very first uh, photographs I did in Los Angeles, just going to places that I normally would skate and attaching a light to my wrist. Then I um, basically yell to Adam, one of my collaborators, open the lens and um, I skate in as close to pitch dark conditions as possible. What you're looking here is, um, it, it seems like it's dusk or dawn. These were both taken past 1 a.m. Um, but what happens is that the camera is left open for long enough that it gathers all this light. So it gives it a little bit of a glow. Um, the piece on the right is called Griffith Park. It's this really fun ditch to, um, to skate in, um, in the middle of the Griffith Park. What's so astounding about those images um, is the dimensionality of the light. And that's not something that I usually consider. The stars are far enough away from my perspective that it, I can almost imagine it just on a flat surface. But what you've evoked in these photographs is really um, a new way of looking at light. Yeah. And I also feel like it has a lot to do with language, right? It's, it's, um, uh, not only are they three dimensional, but it's like referencing time, but in a way it's much, much like, and I like to think of them as a self portrait. Um, and it's, it's like if someone else skateboarded um, in this time, they would have a totally different line, right? In this, and also it's, they, they at some points behave very much like graffiti. You're kind of making graffiti with light and then it disappears. But um, yeah, there, there's like a dimensionality or a haunting to them. And um, I mean, one of the coolest things about this is the actual intersection of the camera, right? When I'm skating, I have zero idea what we're getting. We um, photograph with film, still uh, feel like film has a sensuality to it that is not um, paralleled with digital format. Um, all of these works are printed quite large. Like these two photographs are four feet by four feet. Some of the works are upwards of four feet by eight feet. But I love that you could be, as the viewer, like seduced so far into the photo and put your nose up to it. And so I like that, that texture of film. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to show you is um, uh, of a series called Deep Sky Companion. And um, this also kind of a continuation about the, <laughs> the uh, theme of failure is really a document of one of the most well-known catalogs of the night sky, which is called the Messier Deep Sky Object Catalog. And essentially, you know, a, a quick recap is that uh, Charles Messier is a French astronomer working in the late 17th century, and um, he goes out to find a comet because at that time, if you found a comet, you could become very wealthy by naming it after a duke. And um, he can't find the comet, and it's unclear if he got the wrong directions or he couldn't figure out the math to find the comet. But he finds something else. He finds something that is a blurry object. And doesn't know what it is, but he writes in his diary, this is something to be avoided when you're looking for comments. And he just labels it M1, then goes about um, doing, uh, observing in future evenings, uh, finds another blurry object, names it M2, M3, the fantastic band M83 is, you know, named after one of these objects. And Charles Messier didn't realize that he was 200 years early to discover discovering galaxies. So like in his mind, these are things that were useless and that had um, that were things that you needed to avoid because they weren't the things that were exciting or interesting. And so um, essentially Messier's catalog is the astronomy catalog to that sort of analogous to the periodic table of elements. If Charles Messier was seeing them with his, you know, rudimentary telescope from a balcony in Paris, then these objects are very bright and very close. So it's also, I love this idea that anyone who's ever looked through a telescope ever, I would bet you've seen a Messier object. So over a period of about a year and a half, I made 110 recreations of his um, deep sky objects by using his drawings 
in combination with the contemporary um, Hubble imagery. So on the top, you see a, um, a painting. It looks like it's on a white piece of paper. It's actually on a translucent piece of paper. Um, and then if you just transfer this grid exactly down to the bottom, what I've done is I've used um, that painting in the darkroom essentially to make a one-to-one -one contact sheet to print it in photographic positive form. And I was invited to do an exhibition at the Cahill Center for Astrophysics at Caltech in Pasadena. It's this amazing building built by Tom Main, and there's not one even wall in the entire building. And um, so I collaborated with David Ross, who's a wonderful architect and exhibition designer, and we decided to cut those pieces into discs to replicate this notion of viewing, of inquiry, of seeing that one might get from telescopic viewing, but microscopic viewing. So there might be a shift in, in scale as you would look at these. And um, Messier discovered 110 of these objects. So it's 110 paintings translated into 110 positives. And so the final piece actually creeps through four stories of the Tom Main building. Um, this is one view, but there's actually no vantage point for you to ever see all 110 pieces. And um, one of the most fascinating things that came out of doing this project, which ended up being a three-year project, um, was that Charles Messier sort of discovered these things and kind of like went out of business. And the reason he did was that there was a brother and sister team, Caroline and William Herschel, that were way more effective and efficient at discovering deep sky objects. And from that, I just immediately walked away and I was like, who is Caroline Herschel? Because I had, you know, in, in so much of the history of science, it's very, very rare that you um, ever hear the, that women are included in the canon of the lineage of what we know about science. And um, from there, I stumbled, stumbled upon this group of women um, at Harvard University. Yeah, so on the left is an image of, um, of the, um, the area in which the group of women known as the Harvard computers would um, start to classify different photographic plates that were taken at the Harvard Observatory. And essentially what happens is you have a confluence of, of a, a couple of different different situations happening. Number one, in the late 1800s, women are admitted to colleges for the first time. So they're graduating and they're highly skilled, very intelligent, and they're still having trouble getting work. At the second um, kind of perfect moment, you also have a rise in the accessibility of the camera. And at this point, Kodak Eastman is making glass plates, um, which are eight by 10, just actual pieces of glass that are coated with photo emulsion. And you don't have to, as a photographer, you don't have to coat the emulsion anymore. You can just get a box of glass plates. This will later turn into your roll of film. But, you know, at that time, the fact that this is almost industrialized is really important because you can take a lot of pictures very quickly. And then the third perfect storm is that um, the observatory director at Harvard, he gets a grant and he's able to pay women less than half the wages of men and therefore he doubles his staff at the observatory. And he, it becomes this like incredible force. So, I mean, it still blows my mind when you think about it. 40 years before women had the right to vote, there's a group of 20 women at a time working at Harvard that are, they're setting up the foundation of what modern astrophysics becomes. They're setting up classification systems of the distance of stars, the heat of stars, even the chemical composition of the stars is discovered by one of these women. So it's not that, you know, when we think of computers, um, we were, I think at this point, pretty, um, aware of the term human computer. We know they're kind of doing menial mathematics and, and um, but many of these women were rightly um, pretty well-known astronomers in their own, um, in their own time. So this story was just like kind of too strange to be true. And it's not that people don't know about them. I think the catch is that they were almost like hidden in plain sight. So um, I was lucky enough to uh, get a National Endowment of the Arts grant to do the research 
and collaborate with Harvard University and the observatory there. And Harvard has the largest collection of these glass plates. So there's half a million of these plates, but what's even more fascinating is that each of the glass plates has things that you would, you would imagine, right? Like the day, the time, the year it was taken. But anytime anyone did any research on it, in pencil, they would etch their names, their initials. And so on the right is a little, the curator created this um, kind of magic key, right? It's like AJC, Annie Jump Cannon, and Henrietta Leavitt Swan, and all of these like little keys to figuring out which women were using which of the glass plates and what they were studying. And um, so the, some of the plates are just, Absolutely extraordinary. I mean, I think of this as like a drawing in and of itself, right? This is gives you an example of, um, you know, this is someone who is labeling the stars themselves, but also the the scale of how large they are. I mean, it, it's incredible work. But at the same time, one of the women, um, Henrietta Leavitt Swan, was studying this galaxy here, which was um, proved to be one of the most influential discoveries of astronomy that we've had um, in the last hundred years. And this is the this is an image of something called the, the small Magellanic cloud. And um, if you ever go below the equator, you can see this with your naked eye. It's actually a nearby galaxy. So this plate is where Henrietta Swan Levin actually put together by a calculation of variable stars that she could determine the measuring stick of the universe, the distance of the universe. So fast forward, you know, to the, you know, early, the turn of the century and Hubble's up at Mount Wilson in California. And he's like, thank you, Henrietta Swan Levitt. Now I can figure out, you know, the distance to Andromeda. And it's from her research that he discovers the universe is expanding, but also there's galaxies outside of our own, right? And so, you know, she set the foundation for these things. He, of course, got the Nobel Prize. She tragically, you know, people don't hear about her, you know. Um, but when I heard this story and saw this archival material, um, I felt as though it was a wonderful opportunity to create an experience or an art piece, a series that would, um, that would talk about the experience of looking but it would also make sure to memorialize the women that were in this group. Um, and so this is the, the small Magellanic cloud. And what I did is I made a painting of it in negative reverse form. This piece is six feet by six feet. And um, essentially it's done with a paper that is infused with plastic. So the ink doesn't sink into the paper. And if you were to put your hand behind it, you could kind of still see your hand. So it has like a negative quality to it. And the reason I wanted to do this was I wanted to make sure that the, that the series itself had a relationship with what the women were doing. Now, this is shocking to a lot of people, but women were actually, they were making all these discoveries. They weren't allowed up at the telescopes because it was unheard of for women to be up late at night and in the cold. And so I know there's there's so many head there's so many head shake moments for, in this story, right? Um, stolen uh, Nobel prizes, you know, women not allowed out at night. But um, the title of this series is called "Your Body Is a Space That Sees," and everything that they discovered they discovered through looking through a photographic plate. And I love that it's like, to me, the universe became transformed and experiential when it came into their bodies because they weren't actually looking at the sky. So this is a negative of the uh, small Magellanic cloud. And then what I do is I have um, an incredible studio team. Everything that I do here, it's, it takes many people. They're, we're talking about like very large pieces and um, we turn the studio into a dark room. So we pretend we're chemists and um, then basically prime paper, turning it in from regular watercolor paper to a giant photographic um, piece of paper. Well, I love this behind the scenes because it does, <laughs> it literally is a lab and you are practicing chemistry, even if that's not your trained discipline, but this all goes into these beautiful prints. It's also really, I think there's um, this sense of inventiveness with each project. Like I actually never made a cyanotype 
before this project, right? And the piece behind me is 12 feet by 12 feet. I'm currently making a piece that's 25 feet by 10 feet. That idea of kind of challenging the materiality of what you're doing as an artist is really exciting to me. And like you said, you know, especially the piece on the left, yes, it looks like a crazy chemistry lab um, because it is. And what a fantastic opportunity to learn something. Like we're using chemistry to make a piece about science, right? And I, I, I always love that multiple layering of it, you know, and, um, you know, like the, the piece behind me is inspired by um, some of the early plates from Mount Wilson of the sun. And I love that it's an image of the sun, but it was made by the sun. It's like this solar selfie. So again, it has that like multiple layering quality to it. So we have our negative inspired by our um, archival material, mix chemistry, and then in um, subdued light, we coat the paper with this light sensitive emulsion and then press the um, paper and the negative in between glass. We expose it out in the sun and um, the resulting image is a cyanotype. So anything that's dark gets printed light. Anything that's light um, you know, is exposed and it looks dark. Um, so here is the final image, six by six feet of the Magellanic cloud. And here's kind of a quick corner to give you a scale of the negative and the positive. But, um, you know, one of the things that you'll see as a, a reoccurrence in my studio is I really like to work in sort of the most foundational elements of things. So, um, and I, I think that this ties into learning from the Exploratorium. Like nothing actually is using anything super high tech, you know, that, that I, I'm actually using a photographic process, but there's no camera. I'm using a photographic process, but there's actually no real dark room with, um, you know, like enlargers. I'm just using a painting and then photographic chemistry to print this other thing. So um, that I think also really ties into the way that the Exploratorium um, had me thinking that everything is physical, everything is tangible in a way that um, that is like within your reach, and it's not about this like elaborate technological invention, but it's almost like you you can you can always do the physics yourself, you know. Um, so here's a negative and positive right next to each other. It's really a, like an elaborate way of making a very large contact sheet, essentially. And um, I, uh, I am represented by a fantastic gallery in Los Angeles, Luis de Jesus. This is um, install shots, uh, give you a sense of scale of the works. Um, and I should also mention something I, I hadn't before, but each of the pieces is named after one of these women and what the discovery was. So the Magellanic Cloud there on the left is, of course, named after um, Henrietta Levitt Swan. And the piece that you're looking at the, on the right here is called Triangulum after Adelaide Ames, who was a young astronomer who was studying um, spiral galaxies. Um, and each of them really, I think, is is meant to be like an, an, an invitation um, to, the, to the experience of the night sky that so many of us have, um, have lost track of, right? Like you always think that mountains are yours and the ocean is yours as nature, right? Like those are, those are experiences of nature that you feel um, that you, that, that's accessible to you. But there's so many people who feel like astronomy isn't theirs, right? It does, it's like the night sky, the physics of it is, is like super beyond what we're even invited to. And I hope that this kind of creates a, these are meant to, the scale of them is meant to kind of create an invitation and a re-reminder of that excitement and that curiosity of that, of, you know, of the night sky. And it does feel like a reclamation, as you say, you're kind of taking back the night sky, not only in this kind of large scale, kind of awesome beauty of what the night sky has to offer, um, but you're also liberating the identities of some of these women who worked on these projects and honoring not only their contributions of a piece that once was just a raw piece of data and now elevating it to this different arena that, um, again, brings them back into the cent center and the focus. Right. And I think, you know, when I think of art that's changed my life or that has, you know, really challenged me as a viewer, I always think 
you look at it and you may, it's not that you don't know what it is, but you're so fascinated by it that all you want to do is learn more about it. So, um, you know, on that note, it's like someone could look at these and just kind of wonder what the heck am I looking at? Is that a painting? Is it a photo? I'm not really sure. The blue is overwhelming, you know, and, and then say, well, what next? And then they get to hear about these incredible women because technically, you know, it's like, I'm not a historian. There's so many better people to tell this story, but I am really fascinated and blown away that, um, you know, that of this group of women who were setting up things that were, you know, if you take an astronomy class right now, um, in high school, you're going to learn about the classification of stars. And hopefully you have a good professor and a good teacher who's going to say, Annie Jump Cannon is the one who set up the, you know, how we know the size of stars. Um, but, you know, that was never something that was taught to me. And hopefully art can be a voice to, um, to do that, you know. Um, and one of the coolest things that I found, uh, so digging around at Harvard is awesome, of course, because they're very good at cataloging everything. And, um, and one of the, the most fascinating things that I found, I was not only looking at glass plates, I was looking at personal archives. There's a lot of incredible photographs. This is one of the strangest and also most captivating photographs that I found. Um, it's, uh, it's just called the paper dolls. There's no, um, description of why or what is going on. Um, but it struck me like if you if we can imagine it's like late 1800s and someone says to a bunch of male scientists, okay, everybody line up and hold hands. Right, like the absurdity is just so immediate, and yet when you look at this picture, it's like really lovely. Like there's camaraderie; they all look like sweet and happy, and you know, there's there's kind of a a, a connectivity and a collaboration. Um, and strangely, the the gentleman, the two gentlemen on the right, are not the um, is not William Pickering, who was the uh, director who hired all these women, but the two on the right are are telescope operators. So it's kind of funny because they're operating the telescope, but the women are actually doing all the research. Um, but in this photograph, you have some of the most prominent and, and well-known um, uh, astronomers, Antonio Mori, Henrietta Swan Levitt, Annie Jump Cannon, and so on and so forth. And um, when I saw this, I knew that I wanted to create a contemporary recreation of this photograph. Um, so we made this really lovely catalog um, for this series. Um, uh, again, it's your body is a space that sees. And I invited eight different authors, um, prominent women who write in poetry, prose, science to contribute to the catalog. On the left here is Jana Levin, who is um, a fantastic author, but she's also a uh, physicist at Columbia University and the uh, head of science at a, a, probably a good partner space to the Exploratorium, which is Pioneer Works in Brooklyn. So Jana heads up the science area, and um, I've done a, two different artist residencies um, with Jana in the science department, and her and I actually just recently collaborated on a book of hers. It's called Black Hole Survival Guide. You should definitely go out and get it. It was just released by Penguin. I did all the paintings for it. Um, and so what I wanted to do is I invited all the authors uh, to uh, create a kind of um, homage to these women. And I, I just very lightly kind of said, just make the gesture of this like hand holding or collegiality. So um, on the right, as you can see, this is Jan Eleven and her electrifying gorgeous hair. Um, and uh, Davis Sobel, who wrote uh, The Glass Universe and Longitude, and who um, her last book was about the women at Harvard, um, The Glass Universe. And if you really want to know the story, you have to read her book because, again, I'm just a cheerleading historian on the sideline, but Deva is, a, is the real person you want to hear the story from. Um, this is Rebecca Oppenheimer, who's the um, curator, uh, the lead curator at the Natural History Museum in New York for astronomy and astrophysics. Um, I love saying Rebecca is Neil deGrasse Tyson's boss because that's just so super cool. Um, and um, essentially, 
just like the negatives and positives, this is to scale, right? It's just someone laying on a piece of paper, creating a cyanotype. Um, this gives you an idea of who all of this incredible women are. Um, and uh, and uh, the piece itself is actually 45 feet across and um, a little over seven feet tall. And here is uh, it in, in real life installed at um, in an exhibition called The Same Sky Overarches Us All. And it was at the University of Maryland um, last year. It's really quite beautiful. And I appreciate um, talking about your process, how elemental it is and the most basic tools to make this. And it creates a sort of intimacy, again, that feels like a direct experience, either as a viewer looking up to the sky or this giant canvas in front of you, as it were, or meeting these women um, on the plate where it's just themselves, the sun, the ink, and the paper. And really a closeness, I think, is felt at that scale and unmistaking, unmistakable of who they are um, because it's, it's, just, it's just them. Yeah, and I think that so much of what I think I'm doing in my studio and the Exploratorium is doing is that that science is tangible. It's not something that's outside of you. It's not something that is inaccessible. It's that like those things, if your curiosity, if you're open enough to it, that those things can be, um, can be experienced. And so many people I think have lost the connection that science is experiential. Right. So, you know, and, and quite rightly, when you're thinking about things on the very, very large scale, you know, or the very small scale, when I think of like the large hard hydron collider or, um, you know, black holes, like those are clearly things we're never going to like experience firsthand, right? But there are ways to make those concepts experiential. And that's, I think, what, um, you know, some of my major goals in my, in my studio practice it really uh, follows. And I think that ties back wonderfully to how you first started on your art practice as a way to make science make sense for you and really showcasing how these two disciplines are not necessarily separate, but can serve each other and actually even advance each other. Absolutely. And they're really in dialogue. I mean, one of the, um, the, the ways that I fundamentally think about, um, about what is this connection of science and art um, is, is actually having a dialogue between this fundamental, um, like, like a fundamental urge to problem solve. And, um, you know, one of the things I wanted to kind of talk about with you is how much I love teaching about art and science exactly for those reasons. Because, um, so I'm an associate professor at Chapman University and we have a fantastic art program that's also allowed me to develop and, in, and bring in so much of what I'm passionate about in my studio practice into the art world. And so when we talk about that experience or that invitation, you know, you, we have, I, I built a class called the Intersection of Art and Science, and I take students to NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, we rent out Mount Wilson Observatory for a night of observing. On the right here, we went to the Integratron out in the desert to time travel together um, through sound. <laughs> um, and my students, I think like, at first, they feel like, what do they have to contribute to the to the dialogue of science? And my hope is just by the end of the class that they're, um, you know, they realize that their voice is actually very loud and very, very significant because they're the ones who are turning. Um, they make art projects. It's a studio course, so it's not like a come and look and be wowed and that's it. You get to go, you know, go on your way, you know, super excited. They take, they interact with different designers and engineers. Um, we had um, the fantastic luck of uh, visiting the um, JPL last fall, right before Perseverance uh, went over to Cape Canaveral for launch. So they got to interact with some of the engineers of the rover. And, you know, they're, I mean, what is the difference of um, saying, hey, we're going to send this robot to Mars? Uh, no one's been there before. It's going to go through a kind of uh, a, um, a a launch sequence that no one's ever done before. And then 
you know, that is very, very technical and in, in advanced. But the simple question, and then you ask a student, like, can you make a sculpture that's never made, that's never been made before? Can you problem solve this? I want you to make a piece that, it, that uh, relates to time or relates to scale. That fundamental conversation is very easy for the designers, the engineers, and my students to have because their entry point to their um, their practice is actually the same. You know, maybe my students have a much more limited budget <laughs> for their projects than um, you know sending a rover to Mars. But I do think that the language is the same, and that's the language of curiosity and problem solving. So yeah, yeah, creativity and imagination along with those two also feel like the binding forces that to do something that's never been done before is really going to require thinking outside of what you've experienced or done previously. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that, um, and I, I've been teaching this class for 10 years and in one of the first classes, I think it was one of the engineers on the first uh, Curiosity rover who said, like, if you think it's not about thinking out of the box, like if you even can see the box then you don't belong at JPL, like you have to be a cowboy. You have to be like, that is the only way you're going to, you know, move forward. And I mean, there's an analogy there to art, right? You know, it's like people who are making things that excite you are usually things where you've like, never thought of it and you can't, um, you know, you're, you're um, so excited by the, the, the opportunity to be invited to something new. Well, this has been such a rich and inspiring discussion, Leah. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we sign off? Um, well, I can tell you about one last collaboration if we have time. Um, and that is to just go back to this initial painting um, that I made in grad school. It was based on the um, research of Kip Thorne, who had written a book about black holes. And when we met, he, um, he asked me if I would help him to visualize some of these strange parts of the universe, which is black holes and wormholes. And um, he said there was a young filmmaker who was interested in making a film about his work. And this little tiny doodle that ended up getting ripped out of my moleskin, um, it, he was taking it to, he was taking all these drawings to Steven Spielberg, um, who was at that time slated to direct what would become the movie Interstellar. And over this last decade, Kip and I have been working on a book about the warp side of the universe. It's meant to be actually a, a really large invitation to the general public about um, black holes, wormholes, gravitational waves. Many of you probably have, uh, Kip's name is familiar. He won the Nobel Prize three years ago for being one of the founders of the gravitational wave detector LIGO. And um, what we've done is we've created a, a book that has um, Kip's poetry there's one space traveler in it, and it's my wife, Felicia. And it's meant to be a kind of intimate experience of the universe in a way that is not didactic, <laughs> but instead is meant to um, excite you. So at this point, I've made something like over 300 paintings. I'm sure I have many more to go. Um, we're almost done with it. And um, that is something that I hope you look, look forward to in, um, you know, coming up in the end of, uh, in fall of 2022. Well, thank you so much, Leah, for taking us up to the stars and back and sharing some of your beautiful work and processes with us tonight. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And I um, am so thankful for the Exploratorium for, you know, putting me on my way. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Lucia, Olivia, and Leah, for sharing your work and practice with us. And thanks for watching and continuing to learn with us. Tune in next week for another After Dark Online. We hope to see you soon.